So we've got a great session on income, wealth, and debt. Um, each presenter is going to have 17 minutes, and then we'll do presenters first, then discussants, and then with whatever time's left, um, we'll take questions from from everyone. Um, and and I will turn it over to to Joseph Tracy for the first presentation. Thank you very much, Sean. So we uh, we thank the uh, selection committee for giving us the opportunity to talk about our work. This is joint with Rob Rich, a colleague of mine at the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. Let me just mention a disclaimer, which is our comments today and the paper represent our own views and not necessarily those of the Cleveland Fed, the Dallas Fed, or the Federal Reserve System. So next slide, please. So what we do is we compare two different methods for estimating uh, aggregate wage growth. The first is just a growth in an average wage. So a good example of this is average hourly earnings growth, which is frequently reported. And the second, and in contrast, will be average wage growth. Now, in thinking about these two different ways of coming up with an, a measure of aggregate wage growth, intuition would probably suggest that composition effects from individuals exiting and joining work would lower the growth of an average wage, and we'll talk about how much, but certainly below average wage growth. And a similar intuition would also suggest that composition effects would reduce the cyclicality of a growth of an average wage relative to average wage growth. So next slide. So what we do is we wanna quantify these differences. So we're gonna examine both the level and the cyclicality, and we'll focus on average hourly earnings growth as our example of a growth of an average wage, just because of its uh, common use, and then average wage growth. And we wanna investigate both the magnitude of the differences, but also the sources uh, for their differential behavior. Now, the way we're going to proceed on this is we're going to start with a decomposition of average hourly earnings growth into two different effects. The first, aggregation, this is associated with the weighting of individual wage growths. So these are individuals who are working at both ends of the time period that you're measuring wage growth. And the second is going to be composition. So this is associated with individuals who are either leaving work or entering employment. Uh, over that time period. And as we'll also mention, also relative hours changes for those who work in both periods. Now, unlike average hourly earnings growth, uh, an average wage growth has no sort of direct composition effect uh, from people entering and leaving. What we don't talk about in the paper is that obviously over long periods of time, demographic changes uh, can have an effect on average wage growth. So that's more of an indirect composition effect. And then we illustrate that average hourly earnings growth and average wage growth involve very different weighting of that underlying individual wage, wage growth among workers who are stayers in the market. And earnings versus really an equally weighted. And so we want to explore how important this weighting difference is. Next slide. So our key findings are that average wage growth exceeds average hourly earnings growth by over three percentage points, so by a substantial amount. Composition effects lower average hourly earnings growth consistent with that intuition, but they explain only a quarter of the difference in the growth rates. The primary factor explaining this large difference is how individual wage growth is weighted in the average hourly earnings growth as compared to the average wage growth. And then similarly, average hourly earnings growth is less cyclical than average wage growth. Composition effects, again, lower the cyclicality of average hourly, hourly earnings growth, again, consistent with our intuition, but again, the effect turns out to be modest. And again, it's differential weighting of the individual wage growth that again explains most of the difference in the cyclicality. So next slide, please. So compared to equal weights that are used to construct an average wage growth, earnings weights and an average hourly earnings growth will place more importance on experienced workers who tend to have lower and less cyclical wage growth. And this is the underlying intuition of the results that we find. So how wage data are aggregated across individuals is an important 
but either overlooked or maybe underappreciated issue in the construction or selection of uh, economy-wide aggregate growth measures. Next slide, please. Now, average hourly earnings growth is, again, is commonly reported uh, example of the growth of an average wage. It's calculated uh, monthly from the establishment survey. And it's constructed from a measure of aggregate payroll expense divided by aggregate hours. So implicitly, it's equivalent to an hours weighted average wage. So how would average hourly earnings growth compare to average wage growth? Now imagine calculating both from a common micro data set. We'll be using the SIP data to do this. So individuals working at the start and the end of a period that you're gonna measure the wage growth, they'll be included in each aggregate wage growth measure, and they're gonna contribute an individual wage growth. However, individuals who exit or join work over the period, they're gonna to contribute to only one of the two average hourly earnings levels that are used to calculate the average hourly earnings growth and they're not included at all in the calculation of the average wage growth. Next slide. So let's go back to this intuition of composition effects in average hourly earnings growth and average wage growth. So if we think of differences in levels of growth, one would expect that on average wages of joiners will again be lower than wages of exiters, so this should create a persistent negative composition effect, lowering average hourly earnings growth below average wage growth. However, outside of recessions, uh, the number of joiners and exiters is typically small relative to individuals who are stay working. So we might think that the composition effect on the level of growth would be modest. Thinking of differences in cyclicality, well, again, in a recession and vice versa recovery, low wage workers are more likely to become un unemployed and again in a recovery employed, creating upward pressure uh, in a recession and downward pressure on average hourly earnings, therefore a counter cyclical effect. So this should reduce the overall cyclicality of average hourly earnings growth, again, relative to average wage growth. What we show, though, is that the data supports this intuition, but shows that composition effects are not the primary driver of the differences in level and cyclicality. Next slide, please. So if we look at uh, just comparing, uh, we, here we're using the SIP data to do an equally weighted average wage growth, that's in our orange line, and we compare it to the BLS average hourly earnings growth. Um, recessions uh, is dated by the NBER shown in grade shading. You can see this uh, persistent, uh, fairly large difference between average wage growth and average hourly earnings growth. You can also see in the Great Recession that the two measures became much closer. So you can see the cyclicality differences as well as the level differences. So over this whole time period, uh, really from you know, the 1990 to 2016, the average difference is 3.6 percentage points. So very substantial. Next slide, please. So to make some progress, we start with the decomposition of a growth of an average wage, and we're gonna focus on um, an average hourly earnings as our average wage. And so the, as I mentioned earlier, the decomposition has two terms, an aggregation and composition. If we start with the aggregation term, at its heart are these individual wage growths, that W dot uh, from T to T plus H, that's the individual wage growth for this individual. If we are using average hourly earnings as our average wage measure, then that's gonna get a relative earnings weight for that individual. And then it's scaled by if they're, you know, whatever the change in hours for that individual is from T plus H uh, relative to T, that's gonna be uh, summed up across all individuals who are stayers in the market and get scaled by the fraction of earnings coming from the stayers relative to the total. And then uh, again, adjusted for aggregate hours across the two time periods. And so that is the aggregation term. When we look at uh, the composition term, it looks like an average hourly earnings growth that we show on the left-hand side, 
Uh, and the bottom term, that W bar T, is just the average hourly earnings in period T. But in the numerator, the W bar star, T plus H, what that does is for individuals who are stayers, it uses their period T wage in calculating that average wage in T plus H. So only hours changes are, are incorporated for them. Otherwise, people who leave the labor market, they contribute a wage level to that construction of W bar T, but are not reflected in the W star bar T plus H. And people who enter the labor market are gonna contribute a wage to the W bar star T plus H, but not to W bar T. And so the composition effect basically is looking at these average wage differences between those who enter and those who exit. And then there's an intensive margin, which is hours changes among the stayers. Now, if we take a, you know, a special case where no individuals join or exit and hours are constant, then this collapses down to a simple earnings weighted uh, average hourly earnings. I mean, uh, average wage. All right, next slide, please. So what our strategy is, is again, we're gonna use the SIP data to estimate a SIP average hourly earnings growth, and then also a SIP average wage growth. So we can compare like to like, it's based on the same underlying data. Now we selected the SIP data instead of the CPS so that we can follow individuals who move. And this we thought was, you know, could be a quite important uh, component of measuring uh, average wage growth. Now we begin our sample in 1990 uh, when we have employer identifiers that are more reliable following uh, the literature. And we restrict the sample to try to match as closely as we can to the sample for our average hourly earnings. So private non-agricultural non-supervisory workers. Okay, next slide. So how well does our SIP average hourly earnings measure track the, uh, the BLS reported average hourly earnings? And you can see there's a close correspondence, uh, obviously due to smaller sample sizes, the SIP average hourly earnings is more variable and then that variability increases in the more recent period of time, but they track each other fairly well. Next slide, please. So now we can use uh, our decomposition of the SIP average hourly earnings growth, and you can see the composition and the aggregation terms. And this shows you that the composition term, as our intuition suggested, is cons you know, consistently negative outside of a, a serious recession. You see it go uh, temporarily positive during the Great Recession. All right, next slide. So now using this decomposition, we can express the difference in the levels of wage growth between average wage growth and average hourly earnings growth as the following. Uh, where again, now we're, we're splitting the average hourly earnings into its two components, uh, the aggregation and the composition. Using our sample uh, data for both, we can put the numbers in and we see that the average difference uh, was 3.67%. The aggregation, how we weight individual wage growth, contributed 2.74 to that, and the composition contributed 0 0.93. So aggregation, weighting on individual wage growth, accounts for three quarters of the difference in the levels of the two. Next slide. So now we want to turn the cyclicality of average hourly earnings growth versus average wage growth. We're going to look at this using an aggregate wage inflation Phillips curve specification. We'll use a traditional unemployment gap defined as the difference between the aggregate unemployment rate and the CBO's natural rate as our cyclical measures. And we'll control for uh, long-term uh, inflation expectations and trend productivity growth. So the key is this uh, coefficient beta sub u, that's our cyclicality measure. And we're going to estimate this both for our SIP average hourly earnings uh, growth and SIP average wage growth. Next slide. And you can see uh, when we look at the SIP average wage growth, the cyclicality of the coefficient on that unemployment gap is minus 0.71. When we compare that uh, to BLS average hourly earnings growth, the actual reported data over the same time period, it's much less cyclical, minus 0.33. Now, to do our decomposition, we have to switch to the SIP average hourly earnings growth, our own uh, construction of it. 
that turns out to have a higher cyclicality, 0.502. And then you can see the cyclicality of the aggregation is higher at mi minus 0.54, and the composition is 0 0.044. Right. Next slide. So again, we can put this into a simple decomposition of, these, of the cyclicality, and we can see that the difference is 0 0.21, but 0.16 or almost 0.17 is contributed from differences in the aggregation and only a modest 0 0.044 from the composition, and that wasn't statistically significant. So similar to our earlier findings, aggregation accounts for over three quarters of the difference in cyclicality. Composition shifts do reduce cyclicality, but the magnitude is small uh, and not statistically significant. Next slide. So why is weighting so important? Well, earnings weights compared to equal weights will downweight the wage growth behavior of younger workers. And the level and cyclicality of wage growth is higher for younger workers. And an important uh, source of this is gonna be job changing, uh, which is concentrated early in people's careers. Next slide. Here again, we're using the SIP data, we look at the difference in average wage growth for those who change jobs and those who stay with the same employer. And again, you can see this persistent uh, level difference as well as cyclicality difference. And this is gonna get uh, downweighted in an average hourly earnings growth in terms of the job changing. Next slide. So to conclude and to think a little bit about the future, uh, the choice of an aggregate wage growth measure is important because the series can differ notably in terms of level and cyclicality. We find uh, that average hourly earnings growth and average wage growth weights uh, in terms of how they weight individual wage growth, that's the primary driver of the difference in their uh, behavior. So one topic for future work is to try to reconcile the larger relative contribution of these composition effects to wage growth cyclicality found in the earlier literature. So think of Solenbarski and Parker's uh, QGE paper in 1994 to our finding a very modest composition effects on cyclicality. The preferred aggregate wage growth measure likely depends on the question being asked. Uh, and so if you're interested in how individual wage growth is keeping up with inflation, a topic that is certainly important today, job changing uh, is important, but underweighted in average hourly earnings growth. However, Average hourly earnings growth may provide a better measure of labor cost pressures on firms uh, to raise prices because it more closely tracks a firm's payroll growth. And so for cost push um, pressures on inflation, average hourly earnings growth might be the preferred measure. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, so we will go on to our next presenter, um, Diego Briones. All right, just want to make sure everyone can hear me okay? Please. You can yeah. hear me? Okay, great. Thank you, John. Um, so, first of all, good afternoon to everyone. Um, excited to be able to share some ongoing work that's co authored uh, with uh, Nathaniel Ruby and Sarah Turner. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is a potentially large loan forgiveness program that's targeted to those individuals with high tenure in public service. Um, guide you through our analysis in which we document who is potentially eligible for these benefits and hopefully along the way contextualize where this program fits in the greater student loan financing landscape and what we can ultimately learn from this program's history. So next slide, please. So, so just to begin, the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program, PSLF, was introduced into law in 2007 and it's a relatively straightforward idea. So you have full federal loan forgiveness for those making 10 years of qualifying payments while they're employed uh, full-time for a government or nonprofit organization. So, um, and in the lead up to the first cohorts becoming eligible for this benefit, there were concerns about revolving around program design. So it's a broad definition 
of public service and with 25% of college educated labor force in the public service, uh, this implies a large federal liability. And at the same time, there were concerns that this benefit of uncapped forgiveness would fuel graduate overborrowing. However, when it actually came time for the first cohorts to become eligible, we saw strikingly low recipient counts. Um, several news outlets ran stories highlighting individuals' frustration, uh, trying to access these benefits, which ultimately foreshadowed the policy response we're going to focus on in our paper. But even today, given the size of the college educated labor force in public service, these recipient counts seem quite low. So next slide, please. Now, what I also want to emphasize is that the low recipient counts we observe over time and represent in this figure come at a time when there's increasing national attention on student debt. So student debt now stands around 1.6 trillion dollars across 43.5 million borrowers and growing debt balances have coincided with adverse financial outcomes. And one of the more prominent features to this debt problem are growing disparities uh, across race. And so a natural question to consider then is why have these become defining features of student loan finance in the US when we have programs like PSLF and other income driven repayment programs uh, to provide relief? Next slide, please. So, what went wrong with PSLF? Um, issues that are now well documented and recognized by, by the White House include complex eligibility details, despite a seemingly straightforward description of who benefits. Um, so borrowers not knowing that they had the wrong kind of loans. Uh, at the same time, you had ineffective loan servicing with many borrowers being steered into forbearance when they should have been placed in income driven repayment plans. And so ultimately what this culminates in is that the Department of Education announced time limited changes to the program. So that ran from October 2021 to October 2022. Um, this is known as the PSLF waiver that effectively provides retroactive qualification for the program. Uh, for borrowers that were making payments, even if they were in the wrong plan or had the wrong kind of loans at the time. So the catch, however, was that this benefit wasn't automatic. You still needed to file a waiver application. So with this announcement, what we were really interested in answering is who stands to benefit from the waiver. Next slide, please. And so we zoom in on this specific question with two goals in mind. Number one, we want to document how many borrowers and how much debt is potentially eligible for the waiver. And then two, what are the distributional implications of the waiver? So. What I'm going to do for the remainder of this talk is explain how we approach answering these questions. I'll talk about the SIP, the opportunities and limitations it presents in this context, uh, share our results, and then finally discuss the importance of selection into take up and underline this distinction between the potentially eligible and who actually benefits from the waiver. So next slide, please. So. Right off the bat, uh, the central issue to documenting the potentially eligible is that the Department of Education lacks data on eligibility, primarily because it doesn't have detailed work history information. And this presents a larger problem, ultimately because it limits the targeting ability of the program, and it's difficult to assess which groups are more likely to access benefits. But as other recent work has shown, the SIP has student debt measures, and the key advantage over other data sets is that it both has both a rich individual level characteristics and class of worker. So we can identify if individuals are working in the public sector. I did also want to point out that other recent analyses of student debt issues have used data sets like the Survey of Consumer Finances and Credit Bureau data, which have some advantages of specific loan details and payment behavior, but that ultimately for this exercise, knowing the sector where the individual works is key. Okay, next slide, please. So to briefly describe our sample construction, um, what we're going to we're going to use uh, the first wave of the 2018 SIP panel, and then follow recent follow recent debt forgiveness literature and restrict our sample to those individuals that are between the ages of 22 to 60 and not enrolled in school. Okay, our primary focus is going to be on those that we that we're going to quote unquote call the immediate PSLF eligible, and we're going to define this group as those who are working full-time in the public sector, have 10 or more years of potential experience, and report having a positive student loan balance. Now, some limitations to our estimates. 
are that we don't have any detailed or, or loan payment history. And something that is not unique to the, to the SIP, but that we found in our analysis is that survey data tend to undercount aggregate borrowing and debt. And so these limitations may yield mismeasurement in at least a couple of ways. I uh, want to highlight a couple here. Um, number one, that individuals may be moving in and out of the public sector. So we may be missing PSLF eligible individuals that are not working in the public sector at the time of the survey. And we may miss a sign eligibility to some that have only just entered into public service. So, and another way, even if we're, even if we've correctly assigned public service experience, we can't know for sure that we've met that they've made 10 years of qualifying payments during that time. Okay. Um, but next slide, please. Sorry. <laughs> and, uh, so. Again, so what are the characteristics of these potentially eligible and how might they differ from borrowers altogether? Uh, what we show here is just a, just a slice of the, of the summary stats here. Um, and just to uh, guide you through, through this here, what we see is that women are somewhat more heavily represented in this PSLF eligible group. And by almost construction, the PSLF eligible are going to be older and have more labor market experience. The higher earnings we see for the PSLF eligible are also a function of more labor market experience, but also due in part to these individuals being much more likely to hold graduate degrees and at the same time hold higher average debt balances. So as far as top line estimates, we find that as many as 3.5 million borrowers, give or take, and a cumulative $137 billion in debt was eligible under the waiver. Now, I want to emphasize my previous points on, on data limitations that this is our quote unquote best estimate. Um, if anything, we believe this, this estimate likely overstates the eligible population for some context. As of December 2020, we know that around 670 billion and dollars and 15 million borrowers were in repayment for at least 10 years. So, and if we apply some of our estimates to these numbers, uh, we estimate potential PSF eligible debt around 125 billion. So we do think this is a reasonable aggregate estimate, but by no means perfect. But now turning into our main results, um, next slide, please. And we wanna focus on what are the distributional characteristics of these potential eligibles. So first by occupation. So recall that the, the program, it's a very broad definition of public service. So we want to get a sense of sort of by occupation, who is actually benefiting from this. So what we depict here are the six occupations with the largest aggregate debt eligible for forgiveness. The light blue bars here are going to show what proportion of the population age, ages 22 to 60 hold this occupation. And this is just for context. The grayish blue bars are going to show the proportion of the media PSL eligible holding this job. And finally, dark blue bars depict the occupation share of the total benefits. So, for example, um, those in protective services here, you see that represent about 4% of the eligible and 4% of the total, total dollar benefits. And what I want you to take away here is our estimates show that teachers as a whole represent by far the largest share of the PSLF eligible, but that debt levels that are associated with occupational training requirements are important for the distribution of the dollar benefits. For example, medical dollar me medical doctors disproportionately benefit due to having strikingly higher debt balances relative to other groups here. Next slide, please. So, moving on to yep, education. Um, graduate degree holders dominate and disproportionately benefit given that and this is mostly driven given that they have almost twice the amount of student debt relative to those with with a with a bachelor's degree here. Next slide, please. Um, and now by earnings, uh, the y-axis here depicts income decile, deciles that are formed using individuals ages 22 to 60. Um, altogether, the majority of potential benefits go to those in the sixth to eighth deciles, which are roughly um, those individuals making between $40,000 and $81,000 here, so just for some context. But that also I want to highlight that those in the top decile are disproportionately benefiting here, and those are incomes roughly around over $110,000. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, finally, by race, uh, we find that Black, Amer 
Black Americans potentially disproportionately benefit from PSLF. And this is in part because they're relatively more concentrated in the public sector and that they have greater reliance on borrowing to finance post-secondary investments. Uh, to put some context around this, um, our estimates under full take-up of the waiver, meaning all individuals in our sample of receiving forgiveness, um, show that the waiver could reduce the black-white per capita student debt gap by about 29% here. So not insignificant whatsoever. Um, next slide, please. So, okay, so far, the estimates I've shown here show the distribution of characteristics of the eligible but ultimately how the benefits of these waivers are distributed hinge on who actually completes this waiver form. Okay, from what we do know about take up, the average balance for given is much higher than the average borrower in general and the average potential PSF eligible that we estimate. In fact, it's roughly $20,000 more in debt than our than our average PSF eligible. Combine this with early Testimony, congressional testimony on characteristics of those who had received benefits at that time, we know that about 83% of them had graduate debt and 31% had incomes over $100,000. So this is not exactly reflecting the distribution that we've estimated of the eligibles. So we've given this information about actual beneficiaries, the con, so given this information about actual beneficiaries, the contrast with our estimates, and also a growing literature on economics of take up, we wondered whether administrative burdens may have ultimately screened some less advantaged groups here. Next slide, please. So here, this is just to give you a taste of the administrative burden, you know, some antiquated systems here that you have to most have to required to mail or fax a form, hand-drawn signatures are required, um, knowing who, who your actual uh, signing official is through your employer is, is likely a barrier here. So next slide, please. Um, so again, to underline this point, um, we wanna demonstrate why take-up is important for the distributional implications. We're gonna use that early testimony on the distribution of the actual beneficiaries and then ask what would be the distribution of benefits if that take-up behavior continued with a waiver? So what's, what's depicted here again are the distribution of benefits by earnings decile with a dashed line showing the proportion of the eligibles in each decile and the red triangles showing the proportion of the dollar benefits for each decile under full take up. Okay, so for example, we see that roughly 7% of the PSL eligible, eligible that we estimate are in the top earnings decile and receive about 14% of the dollar benefits under full take up. What's new here are the green squares, which show how the distribution of the dollars would change if take up favored those with graduate education and the yellow circles that take up favor with high earners. The main takeaway here is that under both scenarios, benefits are shifting to those in the top decile with selection favoring higher earners, doubling the proportion of the, of the benefits they receive. Interestingly though, both scenarios do not substantially affect the racial distribution. Um, and as for occupations, there's no appreciable change for teachers under graduate selection, which makes sense given that many teachers are required to have a graduate certificate, but that their benefit decreases substantially under selection that favors higher earners. Um, next slide, please. So to conclude, um, our estimates suggest that many stood to benefit from the PLSLF waiver, but that low take up points to potential barriers for some groups. Um, and considering these issues further, we've hypothesized that the opportunity to wait of the waiver coming at the same time when there's a pause in student loan payments and a promise of broad-based loan forgiveness made the waiver less salient to potential beneficiaries. So individuals, for example, who could benefit from, from both decide that there's no need to go through the application process of PSLF uh, when broad-based forgiveness is on the horizon. So one area for future work uh, is to consider, so trying to estimate amongst the PSLF eligible who might have received full forgiveness under Biden's cancellation. Um, would be delighted to hear if there are any other ideas or considerations there, um, but I'll end there and uh, thank you. Thanks.
Go ahead. We can hear you. Sorry, John. Yeah, you're good to go. We can hear you. Great. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Aaron Williams. I'm a senior data scientist at the Urban Institute. This is co work with uh, two of my co workers, Ming Li Zhong and Bruno Braga. And I'm here to talk today about using machine learning to understand wealth at the local level. Perfect. So wealth is, is, I like to think of it as a springboard and a safety net, right? Wealth can open up a lot of opportunities for family and ways to invest in their future wealth and future earnings. It can also protect families from unexpected shocks, unemployment, you know, needing to fix uh, a key appliance or things like that. But unfortunately, we don't know that much about wealth at the local level, and particularly not that much about non-housing wealth at the local level. Just let me know when you want. Yeah, I think, sorry, the bullet points might not be showing. You can just, perfect, thanks. Um, so our contributions is that we're gonna use the SIP, a cross section of the SIP, to train predictive models for two variables, liquid assets and uh, net worth. Uh, and then we're going to use those models to impute these variables onto the ACS and generate PUMA level estimates of the proportion of households with at least $2,000 in liquid assets and uh, household median net worth. Next slide, please. So, you know, here's Basically, what we're going to get at the end is PUMA level estimates. Here we have uh, the proportion of households with liquid assets greater than $2,000. And the next slide is going to show a map of um, median net wealth. This is a quick chance to plug on the next slide. Uh, all this information and more is available on our financial health and wealth dashboard, where you can pick different areas around the country, look at these outcomes, uh, and many other outcomes from both survey and administrative data. Here I have a quick picture of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where I live. Next slide, please. Perfect. So that's the, the Cliff Notes version of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, moving forward, I'm going to talk about our imputation approach. I'm going to share some of how we use machine learning to come up with our imputations. I'll share some of the results from the machine learning models that we use, and I'll finish by sharing some final results of our imputations and how it validates against uh, another data source. Next slide, please. Perfect, so starting with the imputation approach on the next slide. All right, so the big idea here, uh, on the left we have the SIP. I, can you click advance one more time, please? There's no words, perfect. Okay, I'm not sure why it's doing that. Uh, we're gonna use two data sets to come up with these uh, estimates trying to use the different relative strengths and weaknesses of these data sets. So I like to think of the SIP as being sort of short, not having that many observations, but being wide. For the observations that it has, uh, that it includes, it has lots of information, including demographics and income, which can be used as predictors, and our outcome variables of interest, wealth. Whereas the ACS data set, very tall, right? It can be used for things like smaller area estimation, but it's also narrow. It includes that demographic information. It includes that income information, but it doesn't really include much information about wealth. Uh, next slide, please. So once we actually come up with those household level imputations on the ACS, we're just gonna summarize those furthers, further so that our information is at the PUMA level. Next slide. Next slide, please. One more quick, please. All right, so the paper that we have outlines several different ideas that we borrow from the missing data literature. I just wanna highlight one of those ideas. Uh, the big thing here is that if you use conditional means for imputation, right, maybe just your Y hats from a linear regression model, you're gonna end up with far too little variance in your data and not enough observations in the tail. And so we're gonna be sure to sample from what we hope is a good approximation of the conditional distribution so we end up getting observations, you know, all the way from people with very low wealth uh, up to people with very high wealth. And I have a visual representation of this on the next slide. Here, you can, you can consider just a simple linear regression model. We have some observed data. If you just fit the linear regression model and use those conditional means, 
you're not going to get enough uh, information, enough variance. So really what you want to do is draw from some sort of conditional distribution. I think that's why Bayesian methods are so popular here because you have the posterior predictive distribution. We're going to try and, you know, sneak our way into that using machine learning algorithms. And I think this ends up benefiting our results quite well. Next slide, please. All right, so let's talk some about machine learning. So, you know, a quick thing here is I know a lot of people here probably have backgrounds in the social sciences and a lot of social science training is going to focus on in sample errors. You're going to look at the residual standard error and the R squared, you know, from the data used to estimate your actual model. And in predictive modeling in machine learning, we're going to be far more focused on our out of sample errors. Because what we really care about is if I train a model and I make a prediction, how wrong will my next prediction be? So that's going to motivate a lot of our decisions. Next slide, please. And our, our main goal is going to be to estimate models with the lowest out of sample error rate for our metrics of interest. And we really have two metrics of interest in this case. We want to minimize the error in the weighted proportion of households with more than $2,000 in liquid assets at the Puma city, state, and national levels. And we want to minimize the error in weighted median net worth at the Puma city, state, and national levels. It's really important to note that while we are making imputations onto individual households, uh, we really care about these sort of coarse, robust summary statistics. Next slide, please. So we're going to try a bunch of different approaches. We're going to try different variable pre-processing. We're going to try out different machine learning algorithms. For those different algorithms, we're going to try out different things that are called hyperparameters. And a key question that we need to ask ourselves is, how do we make sure that we're not overfitting the data that we're training so that when we go make out of sample predictions, they're a disaster, they're very bad. And the answer on the next slide is, people in predictive modeling talk about how do we spend our data, right? So we're gonna take the SIP, uh, you know, sort of one wave of the SIP. We're gonna split it into 80% training data and 20% testing data. And we're gonna set that testing data to the side and really not touch it until the end of our process. Using that training data, we're actually gonna split that up into 10 different folds and do something called V-fold cross-validation. Next slide, please. This is a, specifically for model selection, and it's really making sure that we aren't overfitting the chance features of the data set that we're using to estimate models. So essentially what we're gonna do is for any model specification, we're actually gonna train 10 different models. Uh, the first time we're gonna use nine slices of the data as training data and evaluate it against that 10th slice. And then we'll do that again, but switching out which of the 10 slices that we're using uh, for that evaluation. And we'll do it again and do it again and do it again. And at the end of this process, we should actually have 10 different error estimates. We can look at those error estimates on their own. And of course, we could summarize those error estimates. And through this process, we're gonna do a lot of different estimates of error, but it's gonna allow us to do model selection in a way that's you know, a little bit more responsible so we're not overfitting the data. Next slide, please. But the results from that cross-validation probably aren't good enough on their own. At the very end, when we've picked our favorite model, the model that we think is the best, we're gonna to touch the testing data once and only once. We're gonna make predictions on that testing data, and we're gonna compare our predicted results against the observed results in those 20% of observations. And from that, we can calculate you know, a decent good estimate of our out of sample error rate. Next slide, please. So what types of models are we using? Uh, we mostly used tree-based models. Uh, if you're unfamiliar, here's a really simple example of a regression tree that I'm gonna walk us through. In this case, we have 10 observations. We have two predictors, household income and age, and one outcome variable, liquid assets. And our objective is going to be to make splits in our predictors that result in nodes, right? Just groups of observations that are as similar uh, within groups uh, as possible, right? So basically each one of those resulting groups should have the lowest mean squared error. So in this case, we split once on household income. Observations with more than $55,000 in household income go to the right, less than $55,000 go to the left. Then that left node's terminal and the right node, we can split it further using age, where over 48 years old goes to the left, under 48 years goes to the right. Next slide, please. So then what if we wanna actually make a prediction? 
Let's say we have a new observation. It has household income of 78,000, age is 62. We just navigate this tree to sort of hit the node that corresponds to this observation. $78,000 is greater than $55,000. We go to the right. Age 62 is greater than 48. We go to the left. And we end up in that middle node with four observations at the bottom. Now, when traditional regression trees, we might just take the mean of these four values and use that as our prediction. But that's not going to give us enough observations in the tails. So instead, what we do is we just randomly sample one of the four observations in these nodes. Next slide, please. So we're not actually using regression trees. We're going to use something called a random forest, which is an ensemble of regression trees. And you basically do some things to make sure that each one of the regression trees in this forest is a little bit worse on its own. You bootstrap some, sam uh, bootstrap some data before estimating each tree. When you're estimating the splits in your model, fitting the splits in your model, you randomly only consider a subset of predictors. And this results in a really beautiful idea in machine learning where you know, a team, an ensemble of mediocre trees can outperform you know, one really, really good tree. Next slide, please. Okay, so what do the results from this model actually look like? Here, we're gonna start by focusing on liquid assets. On the left, we have all eight sort of diff eight different configurations that we considered. On the right, I just zoom in on the four that I think perform the best. On the y-axis in the right panel, you can see the error in the weighted proportion of liquid assets more than $2,000. This is across those 10 different uh, folds in the cross-validation. And you can see that for these different specifications, the error is bouncing between you know, two percentage points too low to one percentage point too high. And the final model that we picked is the gray line. You can see that oftentimes it's within one percentage point of the true answer in that fold. Next slide, please. Now, a challenge with these non-parametric methods is you don't get nice coefficients that you can compare against your priors or compare against other estimates from the literature, but we do get measures of variable importance. Uh, and so in this case, if we look on the right, we can see that for this particular model, you know, the things that we would expect to be important in predicting uh, this liquid assets measure end up being pretty important. Household income, home value, age, education, state, things like that. Next slide, please. Then at the end, we can go back to our testing data. So this is for the liquid assets model. When we compare it to the testing data, we overestimate the weighted proportion of households with more than $2,000 in liquid assets by about 0.2 percentage points. It's a pretty small error. We also look at the weighted median. We overestimate the weighted median by about $331. I also explored some subgroups, and we find that the accuracy is pretty high for subgroups, including things like race, ethnicity, home ownership, level of education. Next slide, please. So now we're going to go through the exact same exercise, but considering net worth. Uh, same eight model specifications. On the right, we're going to zoom in on the most effective ones. So on the left, right, you can see the errors. It's negative $100,000 to $200,000, right? Really big errors. On the right, you know, negative $20,000 to maybe $10,000 too high. If we zoom in on that gray line, this is weighted um, random forest model where we're sampling from the forest and we've done hyperparameter tuning those errors are much smaller, right? Negative 5,000 to 5,000 usually. Next slide. Once again, we can look at variable importance. In this case, we're actually relying on our predicted values from the liquid wealth model, which ends up being the most important predictor. After that, we see again, household income, home value, age, state, uh, total number of people in the household. Next slide, please. All right, one more time, we're gonna go back and look at the testing data. We underestimate the weighted proportion of households with more than $102,000 in liquid, uh, sorry, in net worth in the testing data by 1.4 percentage points. That's a typo. We overestimate the weighted median net worth in the testing data by about $2,386. That may sound like a lot of dollars, but when you consider the scale of our outcome variable, 100 to $150,000, sometimes up to a million in different Pumas, that's a pretty small error. Next slide, please. I'm going to skip this slide. Next slide, please. All right, so let's look at some of our results. I already showed you what this looks like for liquid assets. It probably matches a lot of our expectations. Urban areas, especially along the coast, do quite well. 
rural areas, not exclusively, do less well. And you can see in the south, particularly in the Mississippi Delta area, there's the lowest proportions of households with liquid assets. Of course, in the tool that I shared, you can zoom in on specific areas. Uh, we spent a lot of time looking at Cook County in Chicago, and you can just see dramatic differences uh, across uh, Cook County, Northern Cook County, incredibly high levels of liquid assets and net worth, uh, you know, in parts of Chicago, almost no liquid assets or net worth. Next slide, please. Right, similar map for wealth. Let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, so one more thing that we do is we go back and we validate our results against the SIF at the state level. So each one of these points represents a state. On the SIP, we have the observed proportion of households with more than $2,000 in liquid assets. On the y-axis, we have the summary from the ACS. Uh, and I varied the points by the number of observations in the SIP. And you can see that we pretty closely follow the pattern in the SIP with some sampling variation, but of course, we're systematically higher for liquid assets. Next slide, please. This is the exact same thing. Each point represents a state. We have the SIP observed values on the x-axis, the imputed values on the y-axis. We closely follow the pattern, but of course, we're too high. So what's going on here? Next slide, please. The SIP oversamples areas with people who have low incomes, and the weights, of course, can affect this, uh, but there are differences between the SIP and the ACS that are affecting these imputed values. On the left, that you can see that at the state level, median income is systematically higher in the ACS. On the right, you can see that medium home values are systematically higher than in the ACS than in the SIP. These are prediction predictors for our imputation models. It means that our imputed values end up being systematically higher in the ACS than in the SIP. Maybe this is good, maybe this is bad. Uh, could be an interesting topic of conversation. Next slide, please. Bring it on home. Perfect. So just to, to put a bow on this, uh, wealth is incredibly important, but we lack good local wealth data, particularly for non-housing wealth. We generate Puma level estimates of liquid assets and median net worth. We think when we validate these results that they're pretty good. And we think that some of the techniques that we demonstrate here from missing data and machine literatures, machine learning literatures could be adopted to impute other variables. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for that. Uh, we will go to our last presenter. Everybody hear me? I know the last time I might have been different. <laughs> All right, is it okay if I dive in? Yep, go ahead and just let me know when you want the next slide. All right, perfect. Um, well, hi everyone, and thanks so much for having us here today. Um, I'm a research associate with the Payne Institute for Public Policy, housed with the Colorado School of Mines, um, as well as an economist for the state of Colorado with the Department of Labor and Employment and Higher Ed. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm losing my voice a little bit, so bear with me. <laughs> Um, today, I'm going to talk about some research that was written together with two of my friends and colleagues, Ian Lange, who's here with us today, as well as Mirko Morrow. Um, the title of our paper is Auto Lender Risk and Households Auto Purchases Less is More, um, and it explores the link between relaxed borrowing constraints on household car purchases. Next slide, please. Well, with a big um, energy transition on the global horizon, um, there's been a lot of discussion on how we can really ensure that the gains moving to a low carbon economy are evenly spread across society. And at the same time, we also know that many durable goods associated with the green energy or greener energy households have high um, upfront costs and need to be purchased with credit. So our overall goal for today is to discuss the impact of expansion of household credit um, and purchases of autos uh, with a focus on low income and minority households. Next slide, please. So um, we know that when we look at data on durable good consumptions over time, we can notice some suggestive evidence that credit constraints impact low income households. Um, so the figure on this slide showcases growth trends in durable good wealth. Um, and this is held by the bottom 50% 50 per, 50 of um, the lowest income distribution. And the two big spikes that we can see here on this graph 
um, are towards the end of the state level banking deregulation, which was um, took place in the late 80s and 90s. And then again, in the mid 2000s, um, when the Community Reinvestment Act, um, CRA, uh, enforcement increased lending towards lower um, income neighborhoods. Next slide, please. So we know um, from previous literature that bankruptcy reform treatment clearing up is a pretty good me uh, mechanism to measure credit availability. And along this thread of research, um, there's a pretty good number of papers that align with the notion that creditors face less risk in the market. Um, when they do that, uh, they are also incentivized to increase lending across society. So this analysis looks at how bankruptcy options impact household car financing decisions. Um, and to answer this question, we use the SIP data set to compare household auto uh, loan assets during survey waves, uh, waves that started in 2001 and ended in 2008. Um, our results suggest that households receive a lower loan to value ratio and purchase higher valued cars. Um, and we also found that minority households are significantly more likely to purchase um, a new car. Next slide, please. Um, here we can see some previous research that has shown us that um, purchasing newer vehicles and getting them on the road has had positive effects on lowering emission levels over time. Um, and currently, Right now, we can see a similar story where electric vehicles are making up a larger share of newer vehicle purchases than current stock. Next slide, please. Um, so for our empirical setting, um, we exploit the elimination of auto loan cram downs for bankruptcy proceedings following the 2005 Bankruptcy Abuse Prevention and Consumer Protection Act. So, Prior to this act, under the Chapter 13 plan, an auto debtor um, could propose to pay only the replacement value of their car, um, to, their car to auto, um, their car to the auto lender, um, instead of their entire loan balance. Um, and so this is what was referred to as call, um, as a cram down, and this made it riskier for auto loaners um, to lend out funding. Um, and after the 2005 act, auto lenders responded to the less the less risk in the market by lowering interest rates on loans, um, and we're also considered one of the winners of this reform. So to highlight this last point um, on the slide is that the use of Chapter 13 bankruptcy is highly spatially dependent as well. And this basically means that, um, you know, we see geographic clusters where Chapter 13 filings were greatest, um, as well as where they were the lowest in the US. Next slide, please. So um, what else has previous literature told us about bankruptcy? Some recent papers have shed light on the fact that bankruptcy court congestion tends to reduce firm leverage um, and the debt to asset ratio. And we also know that a good percentage of cost savings to creditors produced um, from reduced bankruptcy filings are then passed on as gains to consumers. Next slide, please. Oh. Okay. so. Um, why are automobiles a strategic durable good to measure? Um, a paper by um, Raphael and Stoll provide strong evidence suggesting that car ownership is an important determinant um, for employment across minorities and lower income households. And we also know that access to credit can play an important role in closing the income inequality gap in the US. Um, and through an environmental lens, um, newer car purchases during this time also typically imply lower emissions and savings on gas. Um, and there have also been some discussions pointing towards an energy efficiency gap still being unclear for automobiles. Next slide, please. Um, so the figure on this slide basically shows a super easy visualization of how we define our treatment and control groups. We define the treatment group as the top seven states um, whose fraction of bankruptcy files were 40% or greater between 2001 um, in 2004, um, and these include Alabama, Arkansas, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, and Texas. Um, and the remaining 43 states make up our control group. So basically above the line shows the treatment states and below shows the control. Um, and if you notice, uh, these states are in our treatment group are mainly in the southeast of the US. So we do have a concern that our treatment group contains biases due to potential regional shocks. Um, and what we came up with to best address this concern was to um, test for differential pre-existing trends. Um, we didn't find anything of relevance when we did that, 
Um, and these will be reported in the regression tables shortly as well. Next slide, please. So we used um, for our data, we used a SIP um, and we used panels. Um, we used panel waves uh, that started in 2001, 2004, and 2008. Um, and our analysis is a repeated cross section survey, um, and they ask about um, uh, they ask three different questions about um, car ownership um, in each panel. Um, and the 2004 panel um, panel car questions um, asked literally as the bankruptcy reform is is made, so it's perfect timing. However, um, what's bad about this is that the 2008 panel asked just around the same time as Clash Clunkers ended. And we'll talk about that more in a couple slides. Uh, next slide, please. So um, our model is an event study design um, with the 2004 panel survey year representing the reference year. Um, and we estimate three outcomes related to also auto assets. Um, and these include the probability of owning a new car, um, where new is defined as two years or less, given, given the interview year, um, the loan to asset value, um, conditional on having a new car and the value of the newest car in the household. Um, in our results, we find evidence indicating that lower risk to lenders leads to increased lending across society through more valuable cars and lower loan to value ratio channels. Um, it's also important to mention some threats to our identification here. So, um, you know, we were thinking maybe states with the highest chapter 13 files are weird um, and as in weird basically meaning that we haven't solved for the regional shocks solely based on pre-trend testing through our analysis. Um, so there could be something that we didn't pick up. Um, then there's also all the biases around difference and differences that have been very popular in literature during the recent years, um, some which include event study designs as ours. Um, and also, we also don't have actual loan data. So this causes like potential survey respondents biases. Um, and then finally, um, clash, or cash for clunkers, it happened right around the um, last time period of our last time, or the last, or the last, our treatment period's last year. Um, so this could also cause us to overestimate our results um, by households trading in their old cars for money. Next slide, please. Um, so this slide shows our central model equation. Um, and B3 is a coefficient of interest. We include a vector of panel year dummies to control for time trends and the chapter 13 dummy controls for our time invariant differences um, between states, which use chapter 13, um, um, <clears throat> which use chapter 13 a lot versus those that don't. Um, and X is also a vector of control variables like marital status, um, household wealth, um, and whether or not children are living in a household. Next slide, please. So this slide shows um, our regression outcomes, estimating the probability of new car purchases. Um, the first two rows show estimates for our treatment group in the pre-period, and the last two rows um, report estimates during the post-reform period. Um, columns two and three show effects for um, single, single subgroup population or heterogeneous effects associated with low-income housing or if the head of household um, identified as black or African-American. And um, while we don't find anything significant linked to the full population or low um, asset households here, we do for black households. And this suggests that minority families were more likely on average to purchase a new car following the reform. Next slide, please. So here we see um, our results for the loan to asset ratio outcome, um, given that, that the household has a new car. Um, again, we don't see anything significant in the pre-period, but we find negative and significant results for all three of our subgroups in the post-period, um, suggesting that eliminating cram downs uh, resulted in lower interest rates and or more loan approvals, um, and thus more access to credit. Next slide, please. Um, lastly, this slide reports um, our results estimating the impact on the value of car assets by households. Um, again, we don't see anything significant standing out in the pre-period, but we see positive and significant results during the post-reform um, for all three of our subgroups and for um, 
those who identified as Black or African American head of households um, uh, with a heterogeneous treatment effect. Next slide, please. Um, so to wrap this up, previous literature um, argues that consumers are better off, um, uh, have a better off result, um, <clears throat> are better off as a result of bankruptcy reform, sorry. <laughs> um, and um, auto lenders feel that a trade in um, is a valuable risk reduction method, assuming the logic that individuals want to ensure their auto asset won't be taken away. Um, and this means that the loan tends to get paid off. Um, for our next steps, we plan to try to identify whether trade-ins are occurring at the same rate as before bankruptcy reform. Um, and we're very excited for all of your feedback um, and comments on this. So thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Um, and we will go now to our discussants and we'll go back in order of papers. So we will start with. To double check, can everyone hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm Rob Monk. I'll be discussing the heterogeneity and effects of uh, aggregation on wage growth. Um, slide, please. Um, just a standard disclaimer any opinions expressed here are mine and not those of the, the U.S. Census Bureau. Uh, next slide. So in terms of the main contributions to the paper, I'll try to go through it relatively quickly. Uh, I see three in addition to some others that I want to hit on. So first, the uh, authors document heterogeneity and the cyclicality of wage growth among different types of individuals. And this has important implications for how different aggregations of income uh, respond in, in recessions or, um, I don't know, during, or during uh, growth in the business cycle. Um, they then demonstrate that the CBO unemployment gap has meaningfully different correlations with average wage growth and average hourly earnings growth, um, which is what the, the first point would have suggested. And then they recommend the use of the CBO unemployment gap as a measure of cyclicality rather than the change in the CBO unemployment rate, which is what prior papers have done. And they make that recommendation based upon um, regressions that include both, both, um, both measures. Uh, we, they see a strong um, and statistically significant effect for CBO unemployment gap, but no um, meaningful or really statistically significant effect for the unemployment rate. Uh, next slide, please. So there's two things I wanted to hit on um, in terms of feedback that I think hopefully will be relevant for the authors, but also maybe for the attendees at large. Is just first uh, highlighting some changes in survey data collection that might be relevant for measuring average uh, wage growth, and then second, discussing briefly seam bias in the 2014 uh, SIT panel. Um, next slide. So, in terms of changes to survey selection, um, SIP changed since quarterly. In preparing for this, I realized it was actually interviewed every four months, which is not a quarter, but old SIP interviewed every four months. The new post 2014 SIP interviews every um, every year. Um, so it needs a much bigger reference period and will have important effects for seam biases, as, as we'll talk about briefly. But also during the, the older SIP panels, there were meaningful changes in how earnings were collected. Um, specifically, like one case is during the 1996 and 2001 panels. Um, There's more emphasis placed on uh, getting actual paycheck amounts. Um, and then you then use like average hourly earnings over the course of the month to figure out back out average wages. Um, but starting with the 2004 and 2008 panels, more emphasis was placed on collecting regular pay rates. So a regular pay rate would be, say, you have an annual salary of $110,000 a year. You would use the average wages over the course of the month to calculate your um, average average wage growth. Um, the hope with the with this change was that in 2004 and in 2008, um, we would get better measures of earnings. Um, which then might have an important effect in terms of measurement error for average wage growth and average hourly earnings growth. Um, so it's like one recommendation uh, might be worth running separate regressions by panel or maybe controlling for panels to see how these changes could potentially affect the results. Um, next slide, please. 
Um, the other thing I wanted to hit on is seam bias in the 2014 panel. And this is something I've been starting to work on with some colleagues. Um, seam bias has been a, a long running challenge within the SIP. In the older SIP, you can imagine with a four month uh, reference period, um, it was more likely that um, respondents would report an earnings change or a jobs change in the first month, or even the first week of the first month of the reference period. When SIP moved to the new annual um, uh, reference period, we see in the data that many of the job changes and earning changes occur in the very first week of January. So on the right side of the screen, uh, I took, I think it was figure four from the paper. And you can see, especially for the job changers, which is the orange line, there's rather large spikes um, that seem to coincide with, with January when we shift from the interviews from every four months to the interviews from every to every year. Um, so it seems that the, the average wage growth kind of spikes in January, which would be consistent with the steam bias effect where we're seeing that like in January, there's a large spike in income when we see more job mobility and, and more um, increases in earnings in the SIP, um, which could have meaningful impact potentially on the composition effect. So. I think it would be worth, I mean, for papers broadly, but I think even for this particular paper, trying to think through how seam bias might be affecting the 2014 panel, um, and especially how it might affect the composition effect. Um, a standard approach seems to be to either like control for January or maybe controlling for quarter one. Um, you know, I think running table four with maybe controls per quarter might be interesting. Um, but overall, I, I like the paper. It's, it's very well written. Um, I, I think it documents a very interesting trend in trying to think through what sorts of aggregation uh, approaches are best to use when studying the business cycle, but even more broadly, being mindful of how different aggregation methodologies can impact the results that, that, that um, we're looking, looking at. Um, so that's, that's all I have. All right, thanks a lot. And we will move on to Gail Bennett. Um, hi, everyone. Just confirming that you all can hear me. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, so, yes, my name is Neil Bennett. Uh, I am an economist with the US Census Bureau. I'm really excited for this conference. I'm really excited to talk about um, the public Ser service loan forgiveness program in this paper um, today. Um, so all opinions and conclusions are those of uh, are mine, um, and they're not the Census Bureau's. Um, so next slide, please. Um, okay, so student loans are complicated. It's a very complicated system, and lenders don't make it easy for borrowers to navigate this system. So to kind of showcase this, from 2011 to 2017, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau handled over 60,000 complaints related to private and federal student loans. This led to actions that have returned more than $750 million to student loan borrowers. Um, mind you, these are complaints with, that CFPB handled, um, not even complaints to Department of Ed. And so, under this umbrella of, you know, the, the complication of student loans, there is an even more complicated umbrella, uh, which is the public so service loan forgiveness program. And so in 2017, PSLF was among the top 10 issues identified in federal student loan complaints. These complaints were related to borrowers being misled about qualifying payments, borrowers identifying delays in the loan consolidation process, and these delays are costly and disruptive towards progress, towards loan forgiveness. Those are just some examples of uh, the complaints that were, that were handled. And so, you know, this really shows that research on, you know, the, the work being done to understand public service loan forgiveness is really, really important. And so that's why I'm so excited to see this paper and, you know, excited to provide comments on this paper today. Um, next slide, please. So the authors ask, um, what are the distributional implications 
and the impacts of p potential full participation in loan forgiveness enabled by the PSLF waiver program. And these authors estimate using the SIP that more than $100 billion in loan forgiveness is available to over 3.45 million borrowers. They're able to kind of characterize who these borrowers are. Um, they find that borrowers are more likely to be employed in education and healthcare occupations. Um, and also individuals that are black are particularly likely to benefit from the PSLF waiver program. So, you know, after, after estimating the potential distribution of people that could benefit from this program, they compare that with the actual distribution of beneficiaries, and they find that the actual distribution is less progressive. Um, and this is particularly because take up is greatest amongst higher educated graduate borrowers um, and those with higher incomes. And so this paper has some really nice strengths. Um, so next slide, please. Um, the authors offer a, a really nice characterization of the challenges that borrowers face when applying for the PL PSLF waiver. Um, one example that really stood out to me in the paper was this requirement of, of wet signatures from both borrowers and the, the qualified employers at the time that they were um, employed. And so, you know, like we are, we're attending a virtual conference right now. Um, I work full time remotely. If I were to need, you know, a, a wet signature or hand drawn signature from anybody in this audience, that would be very costly, right? Even if it's even if I have to drive across DC, that's that's an incredibly costly thing. Um, so the authors do a really nice job of characterizing those challenges. Um, the authors also another strength is the authors provide a nice like detailed outline of PSLF waiver eligibility, and they they bring this this uh, these these characteristics of this eligibility to the SIP. Um, which I think is, you know, really, really challenging to do. And I think the authors do a really nice job of, of kind of bringing that to the data. Um, so, so I did have those some kind of outstanding questions or thoughts um, that I just kind of wanted to, to touch on. Um, so next slide, please. Yeah, um, so, so the authors note in the paper that uh, one, one data limitation is this this measure of 10 years of experience and so so you can you can calculate 10 years of experience um but that doesn't necessarily mean that this the individual was employed in a nonprofit or in the public sector over that entire 10 years um and so i think i would have liked to see a little bit more sensitivity analysis around that um, maybe expanding that out to 15 years of experience, um, just to kind of, you know, cover your bases. Um, so th the second question that I had or kind of thing I was curious about was when I hear about the actual, when I heard that the actual distribution of beneficiaries were higher, had higher incomes um, and were graduate, you know, more likely to be graduate students or higher educated, you know, one part of that story is is possibly a resource thing. Individuals with higher incomes have higher have more resources, and they're able to you know maybe allocate those resources or that time towards um, filling out the really costly paperwork. But I was also curious. Um, I would have liked to see some discussion on how much work was done on you know maybe the Department of Education's part to reach hard to reach populations um, or lower income populations? How broadly was PSLF advertised um, at the time that it was implemented? And then the, the last kind of thing is, I, I would have liked to see how these results change um, by Hispanic origin. I would have liked to see, um, you know, race and ethnicity um, uh, crossed. Um, so next slide. Um, thank you everyone for your time. And I look forward to um, the discussion afterwards. Thanks. Go to the next paper and Shalise Iromu will be. Uh, thank you, John. Um, 
Yes, I will be discussing using machine learning to understand the world at the local level by William Long and Brega. Uh, Aaron did an amazing job presenting this work, um, and I um, I really enjoyed reading it. So the way I've organized my comments, is I will provide an overview of the paper since it's been uh, a couple of presentations of discussions since Aaron presented the, uh, his work. Um, and as I refresh the audience um, memories on what was discussed and what was uh, done in the paper, I will also provide comments and thoughts on, um, on those um, um, analyses. Uh, so with that, John, could you please go to the next slide? All right, so the research setup and the objectives of the paper um, were to identify a data gap. So wealth data at the sub estate level are not ready, readily available from public surveys. And we know that the survey of income program participation collects detailed wealth information, but because of the sample size restrictions, we can't really produce uh, reliable sub estate estimates using the SEP. And so uh, in the paper, the author set out to estimate network and emergency savings at city and the state level um, and use the survey of income program participation to impute these variables in the American Community Survey that has a much larger sample size and that can be used for um, estimating um, sub uh, state level um, net worth and emergency funding uh, estimates. And next slide, please. Um, so reading the paper and in Aaron's presentation, I feel like local geography, local level estimates um, are not very clear, right? And this term was in the paper used to refer to you know, state level, stop state level geographies. And I think that distinction um, is important and clarifying when it, when you say local geography, what level of geography you're um, talking about. I think in the paper, you use local geography, but also you talked about the public use microdata areas, the cities, uh, regions, state level uh, geographies. So I think clarifying that is important, especially because uh, the SIP is um, not, uh, is representative at the state level. Um, it is, however, um, might not you know for smaller states might not produce reliable estimates, but it is representative at the state level, um, and we do produce um, some uh, state level uh, wealth data uh, tables um, that I provided the link up there for anyone who's interested to take a look at it. Um, so that's something that you should take into account when you are talking about uh, data availability and um, the contributions of your paper for filling that uh, data gap. And next slide, please. Um, another comment in terms of the framing of the paper is that I, I think um, in the presentation area, you did mention the importance of the wealth data. But in the paper, I was left with the feeling of, okay, so there is this big data gap um, at the local level for, and I'm using the local term now, um, for um, networks and emergency savings funds, um, that they are going to fill that gap in the data. But I think, it, but that left me thinking that, why do we even care about the wealth data at the local level? It might be obvious that we do, but I think that Framing the paper so that um, framing the way paper in a way that it's clear to the audience that uh, you need the wealth and data at the local sub estate levels for um, studying uh, migration across or uh, across cities within the states or the human capital mobility within the state. I think it would be important um, and interesting. So I provided a citation there for a paper that you can use for framing the, the, uh, the paper a little bit better about why it's even important to have this data at the local level, what it can be used for. Next slide, please. Uh, so, again, uh, the authors used the 2018 SIP uh, data um, to calculate liquid assets, ownerships, and net worth. 
um, and um, I'm listing the, the variables that we have available in the SIP for measuring liquid assets. Um, and they, in their analysis, they restrict the data to the socioeconomic and financial variables that are common across both the SIP and the ACS. And then they aggregate and they restrict the estimates to the head of the household. So I have more comments here about the data. I think she should be very clear about how you define liquid assets, what variables go into your net worth formations. Do you use secured liability variables like debt on vehicles, recreational vehicles? What about unsecured liabilities like credit card debt, um, medical student uh, debt? So I think being very clear about how these variables are constructed uh, would really help um, I think, um, do I have, if I have one more minute, then next slide, please, um, John. All right, so this is really basically all that I told you about the variables being very clear about the variables, also about how your outcome variables is, um, um, like whether your outcome variables are binary, whether it's continuous, do you, do you categorize your continuous net worth into categories so it becomes a categorical variable? I think those details were missing. Um, and so adding those and clarifying those would be very helpful. Um, next slide, please. Okay. In terms of the methodology, uh, you, um, the authors split the data into training and uh, test data. They do the tenfold uh, cross validation to avoid overfitting and you, they use a machine learning model um, uh, trained on the SIP data to make predictions and imputations on the American Community Survey data. Um, and as uh, Aaron mentioned in the presentation, they use non-parametric models such as a decision tree and a random forest, which is an ensemble machine learning method. So a couple of questions is, I, I, I think a little bit of a more of a discussion about why non-parametric method, um, I think there was a, um, some discussion about that in the paper, but it wasn't clear why uh, for non-parametric models, you chose decision tree and random forest. There are other non-ensemble uh, methods that you can do, like gradient boosting uh, that you can do. And, um, and I would be interested to see um, how your results vary um, uh, across those different models. So I think I'm out of time, but I'm happy to send you my comments later. But again, it was a wonderful paper. It was it had a very creative uh, use of our data, and I was very um, um, happy to have the opportunity to read it. Thank you. Thanks so much. And our last discussant, Brianna Sullivan. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Hi, I am Brianna, and I will be discussing less is more the impact of auto lender risk on household auto purchases. Next slide. The overall objective of this paper is to evaluate the impacts of credit constraints on durable goods consumption. In particular, it investigates how a 2005 bankruptcy reform affected household vehicle purchases via reductions to lender risk. Using the share of pre-reformed bankruptcies filed under Chapter 13, the paper evaluates the effects on vehicle value, probability of new vehicle purchase, and loan-to-value ratio for newly purchased vehicles. Other papers have addressed questions about the reform have done so with more proprietary financial data. So I might be a little biased because of my work with the SIP wealth data, but this paper is a valuable contribution to the literature setting this policy reform because it uses household survey data to evaluate how the households were affected. Next slide, please. So. First, I think the paper would immensely benefit from the addition of figures. I know there were some figures presented in the slides, um, but adding them to the paper, you know, will have the capacity to provide visual support for your models and the claims you make. I'll offer a few suggestions in my discussion, but the most notable of these is that it might support the parallel trends assumption more. So next, the text is a little ambiguous about how the estimation model handles timing. So the text describes it as rather than observing each calendar year, we aggregate the years to the panel year. And this led me to believe that you recoded each reference year as the panel year, 
However, the way the estimating equation is written, it makes it look like individual years might be used a little to some more extent. Um, so it's a little ambiguous to me which of these is true, and I worry that it can confuse others as well. So, in when you describe the estimating equation, you know I think it, expanding its description could be helpful. And then also because coefficients of interest are created by aggregating to the panel year through the panel dummy. I think it would be helpful to also estimate a model that outputs a coefficient for each wave or calendar year and present a coefficient plot over time. I understand that the standard errors might be large, um, so this will ultimately be more of a sensitivity analysis, but it would help support the parallel trends and help me to believe it more, since I find that a pre-trends analysis that uses only two time periods um, is less convincing. And I think this will also help avoid the bankruptcy reform year from occurring in the middle of 2004, in the 2004 panel. Since the policy reform occurs partway through the baseline period, I do wonder if you have a partly treated period and the results are underestimating the treatment effect. Next slide. I'm also curious as to why the paper used a binary treatment variable rather than a continuous measure of treatment, like in the Chakrabarti and Patterson paper, because the control group consists of states who filed um, a similar share of Chapter 13 bankruptcies prior to the reform. I don't know if I view that as fully untreated, so I wonder if a binary measure gives an underestimated treatment effect. And you touched on this in the presentation, but it could be helpful in the paper to describe why 40% was designated as a threshold for assignment to treatment. Um, and are these results sensitive to the thresholds selected? Uh, and along these lines, I also think it could be helpful to present your statistics separately for treatment and control groups if you are going to continue with a binary measure of treatment, since this might help inform um, whether there are other factors to worry about that might affect parallel trends. And in my slides, you know, I suggest a visualization, and I think you presented something similar uh, in, in your presentation. Um, so I think including a figure like this could help readers um, understand your motivation behind the decision to uh, model treatment as a binary measure. Next slide. And then my last comments are about how and whether the 2005 bankruptcy reform impacted the used car market. And your last slide may have um, touched on these ideas. But so in, in SIP data, we use NATA's data on trade-ins to estimate vehicle value. And so we're not using MSRP. Um, and while I'm less familiar with the SIP prior to 2014, it's and it's possible that the methodology has changed, I'm happy to you know, look into and confirm if how the NATA data is currently used is how it was used in the past. Um, so the paper finds, the paper attributes the increase in vehicle values to increased credit access and more favorable lending terms. Because the sample for this particular regression was not restricted to new vehicles, I wonder if this is truly the mechanism through which vehicle values were increasing. So what if bankruptcy reform also impacted interest rates in the used car market, and that resulted in used vehicles depreciating less quickly? How would that affect your interpretation about uh, increased access to credit. And so what I'm really trying to get at is the mechanism through which you are seeing these vehicle value increases. Does the composition of vehicles owned change after the reform? You know, possibly to assess this change in composition, you can add in data sources that um, more objectively measure vehicle quality outside of value. And, you know, if you do think the used car market uh, could have been in fact impacted by the bankruptcy reform. I think it could be really interesting to make use of SIP's panel setup. So for returning households, you can identify cars that are new to the household, even if they are not new in terms of model year. And so then you can estimate whether the reform affected purchases of used cars. So even though you can't identify whether a used car was purchased from a more formal seller or not, I think that could be an interesting outcome variable. So overall, I really found this paper to be an interesting use of SIP vehicle data, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And I think maybe we'll see if there's any um, questions from the audience, if we can raise hand feature. Not, we can maybe just go 
If not, I guess maybe we can go in order of presenters. So maybe you want to take a minute or two, um, so Tracy and then Diego and Dixco in order. That sounds good. So maybe Joseph, if you yes, uh, John, thank you. Uh, so let me uh, thank Robert for his comments. It's uh, very helpful to um, to Rob and I to get insights from folks who know a lot more about the details of the uh, SIP than we do. And so we will we will look into this uh, issue you raised about this uh, seam bias in, in 2014 and see if uh, some of the ways that you indicated that you could try to control for this would make any difference in uh, the estimation. Uh, and then also in the chat uh, earlier, Shalise said, uh, asked just about uh, what specific weighting uh, we used. Um, and our grad, I mean, our uh, our research assistant uh, who worked on this is now deep in her first year of grad school. So I'll have to go and jump into the code and and take a look and see. But we'll, I'll definitely verify uh, which a survey weight and and make sure that uh, I could get an answer to that question. So I do appreciate both comments. And then we can go to Diego if you wanna if you wanna respond to any comments. Diego, I believe you're on mute. Sorry, I uh, hopefully you can hear me now. But um, thank, I was just saying thank you very much <laughs> for the comments um, and the point about the uh, CFPB complaints uh, was was actually super interesting. We didn't know that uh, before. I'm excited to share that with uh, my co-authors. So thanks for that. Um, helps nice way to uh, sort of frame the issue. Um, so that's that sort of began before why the waiver was in place, why it exists in the first place. Um, one piece on the on the sensitivity analysis, um, uh, I completely agree. Um, there, we do encouragingly we do um, do a robustness check where we just take the set of public service individuals that report the year in which they started their job. <clears throat> Prior to 2017, um, of course, that sort of that cuts down on sort of the the sample size. It's we view it as the most restrictive set of individuals, um, and it still doesn't take care of this issue where individuals that we see having uh, or individuals that have that are reporting being in the private sector at the start of 2017. But um, but the point there being is that. Thankfully, we don't see any sort of drastic changes in the distribution of characteristics when we just limit on those individuals that we know have been in the public service for those 10 years. Um, but in terms of your point is actually really well taken about sort of in thinking about the aggregate estimates for what do we what are the how the aggregate estimates change if we just look at 15 years out. So um, uh, that's really helpful. Um, Really quick uh, answer to how how broadly was uh, or was the PSL was there a sort of any communication plan around PSLF? Um, as far as we know, there wasn't any sort of broad based communication plan um, from the Department of Education. There were sort of email emails um, going out. Our how we view sort of just email communication in this space and sort of what we know in prior literature is that. For a program like PSLF, where you have to keep track of a lot of different regulations and rules, that just sort of blanket information is likely not um, the best way to increase take up if that's the goal. Um, so we're sort of, uh, we sort of believe from what we know, again, are sort of just, um, there are sort of just broad based email campaigns, but that is a like, that is sort of, not likely to increase take up in a meaningful way relative to more hands on helping people in this type of program. Um, and then the, um, I think you're absolutely right. We should add, we, sh we should look at sort of the distribution of benefits um, by Hispanic origin. So, um, but yeah, thank you for those comments. Thanks. And, and then we can go to Aaron Williams if you have any um, comments or responses. <clears throat> 
Yeah, I really appreciate uh, Shalisa's comments. They're very helpful. I'll just zoom in on one. Uh, Shalisa asked, you know, why do we use non-parametric methods? And this is, um, I think, motivated by two things. And it's definitely something that I've been thinking about and talking with a lot of people recently. Uh, the first challenge is, you know, the literature around using machine learning with data from complex surveys is uh, pretty thin. And so figuring out how to use algorithms appropriately that account for, you know, the weights and stuff like that. Um, I haven't looked into that with gradient boosting, but I have with regression trees and with machine learning models. And then kind of on the back end, you know, we want to sample from some sort of predictive distribution instead of just looking at the conditional mean. And again, like that's something I figured out how to do with regression trees and with random forest. And I want to do with, you know, other more sophisticated uh, machine learning models, but haven't gotten to it. So it's a great, great comment and something that I've been thinking about a lot. So thank you. It's a lot, and we will go to Caitlin if you have any. Um, um no, I would just like to. Um, I, I would just really like to um, thank you, and I think that, um, you know, I, I think that the advice on on the additional sensitivity analysis um, and what those could mean and look like um, would be very critical to our paper and kind of advancing our paper, um, as well as rethinking, you know, our binary variables. So. Um, that was so helpful. Thank you so much. Um, I know I speak on behalf of Ian and I that are here today and Mirko, who's in the UK, when we say thank you so much, this is really great. Thanks. And we have uh, a couple minutes if there's anything from the audience. I guess we wait a bit. And if, if you can, next to your name, I think, if I understand it right, you should be able to click. And or there should be a hand that you can raise if you have a question. Um, this is Rob. I had a comment for Diego. Um, it's not something that would be possible with the SIP, but speaking of the PSLF, it reminded me of like the EITC bunching paper of like Chetty and Saez, where basically you see this large spike in administrative tax income. Uh, for the self self employed like at the spot that maximizes the ITC and you see a lot of regional like zip code level variation so i wonder if there's sort of like a, a learning from your fellow employees or like your neighbors sort of fact where you might see that there's a lot of variation and uptake maybe by zip codes that might be sort of like where you learn about the PSLF from other other people who, who 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 take advantage of it themselves. So like I don't think it's not something that could be done with the SIP, but there might be some sort of like administrative other source that might allow for the investigation of that. And I think it could be interesting in trying to understand like how it's kind of like uh, spread across the country. Yeah, no, I, it's actually super well taken. Something that's related to that, what we do, what I didn't show in the presentation, but what we do in the paper is, is consider something like this in the in the take up exercise, the proportional sampling, where we think about if you were because when we first did this paper it was actually before the waiver ended. We're actually really interested to think about oh, can we encourage information campaigns, something to be implemented, um, and we considered what if sort of unionized occupations were more well suited to disseminating information amongst colleagues. And so we sort of just assigned higher probabilities of take up to sort of to those unionized organizations. Uh, when we do that, we show sort of we get much closer to the to the distributional implications that we find at a full take up. Um, but your point is, is actually super well taken that maybe we can sort of push on this a little bit more um, and think about that. So, yeah, thanks. No problem. Thanks, and that's taken us to 2.45. Um, thanks to all the presenters and all the discussants. Every, uh, this was a great session. It was very interesting, and we really appreciate all the work you did.